So uh, hello everyone. I hope you we will have a, a fruitful discussion today. Uh, here, uh, if you don't attend from the morning, if you don't attend from the morning, we are in a one of the plans of convergence occupied the territory from 2021, uh, which is one of the projects that uh, has a title entitled uh, "Supporting Sustainable and Inclusive Growth in the Palestinian uh, Territory Through Digital Inclusion." which is uh, undertaken during the uh, AFD funded and a a acted led uh, project. Uh, uh, they will uh, try to identify and create together the concrete solutions for achieving digital inclusion. We have with us today um, several experts from Palestine, starting with um, Ms. Dima Najim, uh, who is the managing director uh, EFE from the United uh, Emirates. Arab Emirates. We have Saru, Mr. Saru Nakashian, who is the CEO of EFE Palestine. We have Mr. Faris Alami, the CEO of International Strategic Management. We have Ms. Hania uh, Bitar, who is the General Director from PLRA. And we have Mr. Rami Mahdawi, who is the Assistant Deputy for International uh, uh, Relations and Funding in the Ministry of uh, Labor. So, uh, I will start by uh, presenting the participants and uh, then we will give them uh, five minutes to present their subject and then we will go to an interactive session. So if you have something you would like to ask the presenters or the participants, the speakers, please write it in the chat box and I will be happy to pass your message to the uh, speakers. So starting by Mr. Saro, or Ms. Dima, sorry, Ms. Dima first. Uh, Ms. Dima is the, as I said, uh, during her 17 years of experience, worked in the MENA region in Syria roles, managing NGOs and economic uh, development programs, targeting women and youth with a focus on skills development and financial inclusion. She, she assumed the role of managing director of education for employment in the United Arab Emirates in 2017. Uh, Dima has significant experience in women and youth employment and financial inclusion, in addition to her expertise in partnership management, fundraising, operations, management of NGOs. Before moving to the United Emirates, she held the position of Chief Operation Officer of Relief International in Iraq and uh, 2010 was part of the team assigned by AG fund to establish the first microfinance bank in Syria and assume the position of operation manager and intern general manager of the bank. Before Dima worked with the United Nations and Syria Trust for Development, Dima holds a BA in economy and master degree in banking and financial sciences. Please, Ms. Dima, the mic is yours. Uh, let's hear what you have for us regarding our session today securing uh, of course uh, the title of our session is uh, uh, securing uh, a future for youth employment in digital economy go ahead please thank you very much uh, dr safa for uh, the great introduction and uh, thank you for having me with you today it's really an honor to be part of uh, this very important conversation um, for today, my uh, intervention is going to be a little bit different. Um, and I don't want to focus on the skills and discussing the skills that are needed for the digital economy, which I believe uh, my colleagues uh, here are really the experts in this area. What I would like to talk about is um, uh, us as stakeholders, uh, us as governments, nonprofit organizations, uh, academic institutions, how can we utilize the data out there, the, the millions of data out there to, to be able to really know what are these skills and what are these jobs and how can we uh, create programs, training programs, academic programs and uh, interventions based on this uh, data driven um, uh, method. So this is what I would like to, to talk about today. And uh, uh, fortunately at, uh, at EFE, we have been really focusing on our digital transformation. So we have some kind of experience in, in these uh, uh, areas. And uh, we uh, have been working on uh, utilizing um, business intelligence tools, uh, artificial intelligence tools in 
um, uh, really understanding what's out there in the market in terms of the jobs and uh, what are the skills that we need to focus on. Um, so uh, um, talking about the uh, business intelligence and artificial intelligence, as, as we all know, uh, the jobs are out there uh, online, on different portals, the skills uh, also are mentioned. So uh, utilizing business intelligence tools and artificial intelligence tools allow uh, us, um, uh, the people who are creating these programs, these trainings, uh, to be uh, really specific in terms of what are the jobs out there. And um, from our experience, and we all know that uh, the labor market is really um, uh, going towards the automation, uh, being digital and dynamic, we know that we need to, uh, no matter what, what are these sectors, we need to skill uh, uh, the citizens and the people to be prepared for this this future uh, and three areas that are going to be really uh, the same regardless of the occupation or what kind of jobs we are talking about uh, the first one is going to be the value that they will add um, and how is that going to be different from the automated systems and intelligence uh, intelligence machines uh, also, we need to make sure that they can operate in a digital environment and this, uh, these skills, the digital skills are inclusive. Everyone has access to these skills and are able to utilize this regardless of what occupation they, uh, uh, they are going to be uh, working in. And finally, um, adapted to new ways of working. Um, for example, we all now uh, know that uh, our youth in, in different uh, areas and different regions now have access to platforms and now have access to uh, jobs and gigs uh, outside, outside of uh, their country. And that really um, highlights the importance of um, skilling them, providing them with uh, both technical and uh, soft skills in certain areas where they can actually work in, you know, in different countries for different organizations, for large corporations and in areas that are not limited to uh, the small geography where we live in. Um, so if we talk about the adapting uh, the business intelligence and artificial intelligence tools, uh, there are um, in general, um, uh, there are so many reasons for us to be able to uh, or to want to do this or focus on this. Uh, one of them is identifying the uh, growing and sustainable uh, sectors uh, in our own uh, local economy, but also uh, globally. Uh, the second important uh, reason for utilizing these tools is going to be identifying the uh, demanded skills, uh, soft and technical skills, based on sectors and industries, in addition to identifying the uh, skills gap, uh, so which is comparing what we need in terms of uh, uh, what the job market needs and uh, the, the supply, what do we have, what our use, what are the skills that they have and what is the gap and where do we need to really intervene. And finally, we need to identify the leading hiring trends and employers and companies and to do that, uh, the first question we need to answer in our uh, data strategy framework is the why. Why do we need this? And uh, we established that uh, uh, it's, it's very important to, to, to really understand the skills that are needed. The second thing, the what. Uh, there are millions of uh, data points out there. So what do we need to collect? We need to collect uh, the number of vacancies out there, companies, uh, the particular skills that are needed for each vacancy for each sector and of course we need to uh, uh, analyze the data about the uh, the supply what's in the market and what are the skills that are missing and then uh, finally um, being able to design the programs and design the academic uh, 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 programs uh, based on these needed skills and how, of course, it's not really once we understand. Let's say programs that are based on solid information from this data. Thank you, Dima.
uh, I should stop you here. Excuse me, <laughs> because you are uh, you are passing the uh, your message to the next speaker, who is Mr. Saru Nakashianu, who will be speaking about the academic programs. Uh, as you said, we have to arrive at the end to what are academic programs that are needed, what is the curriculum needed for the youth. So uh, Mr. Saru will be speaking about this issue and on other issues. Uh, so to introduce uh, first Mr. Saru, he is the uh, CEO of Education for Employment Palestine. He is the assistant, also assistant professor at Birzeit University, uh, a seasoned and management and marketing expert with over 25 years of experience. I'm a 35 Saru, I think. <laughs> <laughs> developing and managing programs that build the market and management capabilities of individuals and organizations to succeed through the years of study, teaching, training, consulting, coaching, and doing his work in academia, NGOs, private sector, and and has experience with including, but not limited to EU, UNIDO, UNRWA, w, uh, World Bank, MEPI, uh, USAID, and uh, uh, Australian, uh, Australian Aid. He holds a PS uh, in management, MBA concentration marketing from Fairlight Dickinson University, and MPhil in HR and entrepreneurship uh, from Maastricht School of Management in the Netherlands and a PhD in entrepreneurship from Yervin State University, uh, chairman of board of Jezur Foundation, former chairman of the board of World Vision Jerusalem, border member East Jerusalem YMCA and general uh, and central committee member World Alliance YMCA Geneva. So with all this experience and great experience, I think Saru, you have uh, much to tell us about uh, what you have in EFE and for uh, the unemployment or decreasing unemployment and increasing the employment. Please go ahead, Mr. Saar. Hey, uh, thank you, Dr. Safa. And uh, hello, dear colleagues and everybody that has joined us today. Um, it is a, a very important topic that we discuss. Uh, it is about employability. And uh, I would like to give a very brief introduction to education for employment. It is a organization that looks at its end results uh, into employment. So we do training to employ youth, and that has been our uh, mission. Uh, across the MENA region, we have trained over 125,000 youth and about 65 to 70% of, of employment. Uh, in Palestine, we have trained about 18,000 youth and again about 70% of employment. Uh, so it is our, it is very important for us that we understand the youth, we understand the market and how to move on. So the first question I would ask myself is, uh, what is a skills gap in the workforce and specifically for a university graduate? The answer to this is a, is a mismatch between skills, employers that rely upon and skills that graduate job seekers have. So if you don't have the right skill, the employer will not take you. So that is a problem that everybody is facing. So closing this gap is what we are looking for uh, to help the young people to get their first jobs and to get the employers to get their first jobs. The skill gaps that are facing employers today, in general, I would talk about are problem solving, resilience, communication. And here I would include digital communication, which is very important as part of that. Other skills that are currently needed are creativity, flexibility, adaptability, and of course, always we talk about leadership. The gaps that we are talking about are global. However, they are also found in different countries worldwide. Contrary to the belief that every country is unique, we know since in the digital world, there are no borders, there is no uniqueness. So it is trans transferring all these different requirements across borders to all, all countries. Now the problem arises when university programs value certain kinds of skills while the employers value other kinds of skills. For example, skills that students are most likely to underestimate are the data skills, the digital skills and resilience. While students, on the other hand, it is found that they are mostly valuing creativity, leadership, languages, 
And if this is what is emphasized at universities, then those are, those are the things that are valued by the students. Although the digital divide always existed, however, the need for digital skills became a necessity for employment. And the latest employment trends that we are looking at have shown that youth are employable even with basic information technology, even in jobs that are not tied to IT sector. So the, the, the digital technology is important for every job. For example, today graduates with the ability to use Excel spreadsheets are more likely to be employed. Accounting graduates with uh, skills in accounting software are highly employable and more likely to be employed as in, in when they compete with their colleagues. In many industrialized countries where large corporations exist, entry level positions are available for university graduates. In Palestine, several of the large corporations have entry level positions where youth are oriented and trained to take full responsibility of a position. However, even in an entry level position, candidates are expected to have the digital skills because they will not be trained in these skills on the job. It is today, it is something that you come with to, to the corporations to start your job. So according to the Nielsen company, the digital divide comes in three stages, economic, usability, and empowerment. And this is where our role comes in. It is in the empowerment of youth to become more oriented to be with digital skills so that they can be more employable as we go. On. As we know today, in any kind of job that you are seeking, uh, for example, a mechanic, a carpenter, an interior designer, and even a truck driver, without digital skills will not be able to compete for a position or as an, as an entrepreneur because the truck driver, when he makes his delivery today, he needs to use his little tablet, which is digitally linked to the, to, the, uh, to the corporation to say how much sales he made, to give out the receipts. So not only skills in truck driving, but a little bit of digital skills are even required for it. So these are some of the things that we are facing today. And so from university graduates to uh, graduates from uh, specialized community colleges or graduates from technical schools, they all need this kind of technology and this kind of digital skills. Thank you, Dr. Sapa. I give back to you. You have still 15 seconds, Saru. So you are very sharp in your presentation and your intervention. And uh, since he spoke too much, uh, not too much, he spoke, uh, he gave us uh, information about the workforce and the work needed, you, need, you see, now is your uh, alarm stop. <laughs> so I will stop it to start it after you. So you work, you spoke about the employers and the work, uh, uh, what work needs. So we will uh, pass to Mr. Faris Alami, who uh, we expect to hear from him about the models uh, that he would be speaking about to, uh, to us about increase how can we can increase youth engagement in the digital sector, freelancing, and entrepreneurship. So to present uh, Mr. Faris before giving his him the the mic or the the to start his uh, intervention, I would like to present him as uh, so Mr. Faris Alami. As ISM founder, works for international leaders and entrepreneurs on strategies and implementations to create an empowering, empowering environment for startups and existing businesses to prosper and grow. He has functioned as special advisor and entrepreneurial ecosystem expert with the World Bank, business advisor uh, with Goldman Sachs uh, 10,000 uh, Small Businesses Program, affiliate with Kaufman Foundation, mentor to MBA students and entrepreneurs uh, globally. In his work, he facilitated the economic and work placement, uh, work, workforce development programs that included entrepreneurship, small medium enterprise development, mentorship, and and funding. So Mr. Faris uh, has insights, strategies, and facilitation in launching entrepreneurship activities that has uh, sought out of uh, out by uh, 
has been sought out by more than 61 leaders of nations and organizations. ISM, uh, his company, ISM's program include training entrepreneurs, trainers, and management teams in exporting, in supporting entrepreneurship and technology, retail, workforce development, leadership, and culture related programs. Uh, Mr. Ferris founded uh, the nonprofit Connecting Dots Globally, a STEMpreneur program in which high schools and university students learn to launch a global technology uh, company. He, uh, in addition, he is the host of the weekly Finjan show broadcast. So Mr. Ferris, with all this experience, I, I'm sure that we will learn from you a lot now today. Please go ahead. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Safa. Thank you, Dr. Saro. Uh, thank you, Dima. Thank you uh, in advance for Rami and Hania for the panel. And of course, thanks for the host for being, uh, for allowing us the space to have this discussion. Uh, in general, I wanted to discuss really uh, the mindset. What I'm gonna talk about is really five points. And these are what I feel like important for the next generation of workforce, or you could call them talent, or you could call them, you know, the next workers, right? And I think the reason why I want to focus on these five things because Saru really hit on it. There is a gap between what's being produced from you know our system as a whole and what the community or the 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 environment is needed. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is hands-on experience. So one of the things that entrepreneurs look for is hands-on experience. They like the you know they like to hear the numbers, and I have some numbers, right? I think you know zero to twenty-four per uh, age zero to 24 age in the in Palestine is about 64%. Over 50% of the population in Palestine is zero to 29, right? So there are lots of numbers that we could give them, but at the end of the day, they're looking at, can I employ or deploy this person to do something for me for the organization? So hands-on experience is number one. And you could do that today with lots of different ways. Internship, maybe paid internship through the, you know, the different environment or different institutions that could pay for the individuals to do the internship, fellowship, on the job training. You could do all kinds of models at the universities and the communities or the nonprofits will already know. The second thing I'm going to say is the teaching for freelancing versus a job. So understanding that today's environment, most of the people who are with us today, and I'd love to hear from them, is how many of you have more than one job? And what you will be surprised is most people have more than one job. Very few people have one job and that's it. So training them and understanding that it's the jobs of jobs, meaning that you will have one job as long as you have multiple jobs. And how to do that is really by helping them understand what does a freelancer do or doesn't do. So that's the second thing. The third thing I'm going to say is entrepreneurship mindset. And Dr. Sauron touched a little bit on it, which is the whole concept of what problem am I solving or what opportunity am I creating, right? So helping them understand, always look for solutions. Don't look for problems, look for solutions. Look for solutions for, for, for other people's problems. So if there's a problem somewhere, rather than discussing the problem, what can be done about it? What's the opportunity there? So there's a shortage in caps, all right, what can we do about that? There is a, you know, Shortage of food, what can we do about that? Looking at the solutions is really important to have this entrepreneurship mindset. The fourth item I'd like to bring up is training. A lot of times we think that, you know, by exposing them, they will be able to do it. So hands-on experience is important, education is important, but also training is important. Having someone that trains them, that stands by them, that directs them, that gives them feedback is vital to the process of getting the next generations of, you know, people who could work in this digital new economy. And Sauro said earlier, the divide was already there, but the divide today is maybe twice, three times, four times as big or faster, moving at a much faster speed. And then the last point I'm gonna bring up, and as you could tell, we could speak about any of these things for the next two days, <laughs> right? Uh, I wanna just uh, give brief remarks so we could have an open discussion at the end, is really the environment of collaboration. Most of the people today are trained to do their job or trained to do, or the environment expose them to be in a solo street. And what I'd like to say is there should be a collaboration or bigger collaboration, and you can't do it with all the departments. You can't do it with every single person. You just need to find what I'm going to call champions in each one of these institutions, government, education, and industry. 
there has to be a champion from each one of these institutions that want to collaborate. So therefore, the, the, the youth is being exposed to this whole new digital idea of collaboration, of having getting people together, looking for problems and finding the solutions, getting them trained, helping them understand that you might work for these three different institutions, not necessarily one, and then having them that handle an experience will bring all of those things together to have an entrepreneurship mindset. I could keep going, but I'm going to stop right there so we could uh, allow uh, more time maybe for questions and answers and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ferris. Uh, you have given us uh, much insight in this uh, subject, but I will, start, uh, I will go now to a special person, at least special to me, and then special in her ideas, in her ideas, not his ideas, her ideas, she knows herself. <laughs> so we all spoke about the positive things that people should be knowing, having the skills and ready for the workforce and so on. But we never, we didn't now touch on the effect on the society. And if there will be a divide because of the, the digital experiences and so on. Our big topic is digital inclusion, but what you have presented till now, does it ensure inclusion or it, it gives something else? So what are the challenges in this digital world? And also what are the challenges for other people in the labor market? And this will be a little bit touched by Hania, Ms. Hania Bitar who is my friend and is the founder and director general of the uh, Youth Association for Leadership and Rights Action, PLRA, since 1999. She started her professional career as a teacher of English language at Bethlehem University, then acted as a business manager at the Jerusalem Times Weekly newspaper. In 2005, uh, uh, Ms. Hania Bitar, Mrs. Hania Bitar founded uh, uh, along with a number of women leaders, the International Women's Commission for a Just and Sustainable Peace. She ran a candidate also for the Palestinian Legislative Council elections within the third way national list. Currently, she serves as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Arab American University of Jenin and a board member of a number of local Palestinian NGOs such as Miftah and uh, W. Kilak. Bita, uh, Ms. Hania Bitar is one of the founding members of uh, Milan uh, Media and Information Literacy Experts Network. Uh, Bitar is also, was also nominated as Global Leader for Tomorrow and Young Le Arab Leader. And she is the author of several articles and keynote speaker at a number of national and international conferences. Please, uh, Ms. Hania, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Safa, and thank you all the panelists and those who are really like listening to us. Um, uh, actually, I will start by uh, telling you a short story. It's the story, you know, the name is not true, but uh, let's say her name is Suha. And Suha actually is from the surrounding villages of uh, Jerusalem. And uh, a few years ago, I think when I say the story, people will remember it. Um, uh, actually, she was a makeup artist and she was uh, she owns lots of digital skills to enable her to market her her business online. So she had her special pages and the women were like happy with her work and going to her. But suddenly, actually, uh, someone uh, stole some of the private uh, pictures of Suha and uh, um, what do you say it along with like Photoshop or whatever, they changed some of the things and they, they became viral in her village everywhere amongst her friends and neighbors. And unfortunately, Suha committed suicide. Um, so actually this is the story of Suha and this is truly what happened. And she wrote a letter saying that she cannot bear the pressure and the defamation and the rumors that has fallen upon her and uh, upon her family. Keep Suha's story in mind. We'll go back to it, actually. Today, we are gathered, actually, to discuss how to secure a future for young people's employment in the digital economy. There is no doubt, and I think um, Dima, Saro, and Faris talked a lot about the importance of digital skills and what, uh, what is really needed by the digital market, uh, whether currently or in the future. 
And um, digital skills, sometimes so many people don't really understand what is digital skills, but it can go as simple as I think many of us have digital skills and many of us don't have digital skills. But actually, um, if we start searching online to see who won, is it like Messi or Ronaldo online to see who, who won a game, this is part of the digital skills. If we do, uh, if we follow up our banking accounts online, uh, this is also part of digital skills. If we, uh, not in Palestine, but in many other countries, actually, if you try to order a certificate or a birth certificate or any document from your governmental um, institutions online, this is, again, part of, uh, of digital skills. So there are a big range of things that we do, and uh, they are part of digital skills. Some of those are beneficial to us, but it doesn't always like really ring this bell, this bell. But it certainly, certainly digital skills are actually the key ingredients when it comes to the future of digital economy. In fact, according to international uh, labor organization, four out of five workers uh, who were affected during Corona because of the closure of jobs on the global level, uh, you know, they were affected. And certainly now with the closure and continued closure, and we don't know what is happening, things started to improve. But this really proved the corona crisis uh, proved how much more than ever, you know, we need actually to move into the digital, virtual, and uh, remote learning to ensure opportunities for people to earn a living in the future. And uh, it's estimated by, that by the year 2025, the whole Middle East region, and we are part of them, there will be around 160 million potential digital users who will contribute significantly to, to rapid economic growth. But certainly, it doesn't stand alone to digital skills. So if we go back to Suha's stories, we see that Suha had the digital part of the digital skills needed because we saw how Sara was talking about even taxi drivers needing, uh, you know, knowing to, uh, having to know how to use a tablet and to how to follow things online. So the same with Suha. She had some digital skills, but what she re really lacked was media and information literacy. So she, need, she lacked the skills which could make her survive safely and responsibly in the digital world. According to Valentina uh, Milenkova and some others, actually this digital skills and media and information literacy equals, are equal, uh, equals different aspects of the digital person. So a digital person actually is the person who is responsible for how they use technology. So, the, so the, the digitalization has to do with the use of technology, but uh, MIL, media and information literacy, has to do with how a person will be responsible in how they use uh, uh, digital information and technology. Now, this issue of, of media and information literacy, known uh, as MIL, actually, um, came especially after the widespread of digitalization and how we, we see like even with our own kids, you know, we, we leave them for hours hooked behind their smartphones in closed rooms. We don't know with whom they are chatting, who is trying to really like uh, brainwash their minds, uh, in which circles they are, uh, do they belong? What do they believe, what they don't? So actually there was lots of research globally to try to see how can we make uh, the life online safer. And they tried different options. They looked into like, should we allow governments uh, a green light to censor? Of course, no, 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 no. This is a taboo, not just in Palestine, everywhere, because this is what governments want, you know, to have uh, a stronger hand to control really the flow and the uh, information. And uh, uh, Safa is showing me the time, but you know, I have some extra minutes from Saro and Paris. I will ask you. I will ask you questions to cover cover your yes, intervention. Yes, just give me one minute. Yes, go ahead. So, um, so eventually, when they look even at like, should internet companies try to also like filter the content? Should parents uh, make blog or whatever? 
he discovered everything is futile because kids in the end, people in the end will find their own ways to get access into, um, into the, to be online. And so this is why when we talk about uh, media and information literacy, it's really like, would you ever be able to throw your kid into the sea and ask him to swim? If you don't really teach your, your kid the skills needed to swim and survive in the sea, so this is really what is media and information literacy is all about. So when you give people the skills on how to survive and be responsible and safe in the digital world, you actually help them to avoid cyberbullying, to avoid uh, digital, uh, you know, uh, to, to uh, misinformation, all this issue about infodemic, whether it's uh, fabricated news images and now with the fake, fake, uh, deep fake. You also teach them how to be secure online. You, you teach people lots of skills that are needed to really survive in this digital world. I will stop here and uh, wait for your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hania. Um, as expected, your intervention is very fruitful and important to this session. And I would like to concentrate again on the mail, on the media uh, and information literacy that uh, Hania spoke about and what skills are needed to survive safely. I like the expression to survive safely in the digital world. But she also mentioned two points that will lead to the intervention of Mr. Rami. One of them about the, how many users will be in the digital world uh, uh, contributing to the digital economy or to, to the, uh, the economy of uh, uh, economic growth. And the second, what governments should do. And since uh, Mr. Rami is from the government, from the Ministry of Labor especially, uh, I hope uh, he will be speaking to us about some strategies that uh, uh, they are doing in the Ministry of Labor uh, to uh, enhance or to decrease the unemployment rate as well as for the digital inclusion also and the digital skills needed. So Mr. Rami, as you may know, Harbat CV Tabatak Rami and Habal Arabi Lahzos Adawar Ali. I will translate or read it in Arabic. I don't know. Uh, should I say it in Arabic? Because you, you sent it in Arabic. So I will speak the CV or a, a little bit the bio about Rami in Arabic. يعمل سيد رامي مهداوي بمنصب وكيل مساعد للتعاون الدولي والتمويل بوزارة العمل مما مكنه من تنفيذ العمل الحكومي بشكل سياساتي أكبر من الشركاء مع الشركاء المحليين والدوليين بعد أن تمكن من تنفيذ العديد من الشريعة والصعيد الميداني خلال السنوات الماضية وتم توليه مهمة إضافية بناء على قرار وزير العمل أن يكون متحدث الإعلام بسبب وزارة العمل عمل مديرا عام للتشغيل في وزارة العمل الفلسطينية ثم انتدب, انتدب المهداوي لوزارة المالية He also worked uh, for three years in the Ministry of Labor and worked for nine years in the government sector and the international sectors too. He got an MA in uh, Human Rights and a an BA in Political Sciences from Birzeit University. And he got a BA from Birmingham. Um, which allowed him to work in the academic realm. He also got a degree from Harvard in 2015. He is an author in Al Ayam uh, newspaper, and he works in the development and writes about the development of the Palestinian society and talks about the causes in Palestine, the social and economic ones. He was selected to be part of Al Qasab Theater in Ramallah. He was also a coordinating member, which has over 15 members, member organizations. He joins us all the time in many discussions regarding the Ministry of Labor, which are very vital topics. I don't think he remembers them but I know that he is very active um, socially and politically. Mr. Rami, you have six minutes. I talked about you. 
سأخذ دقيقة أخرى من فارس شكرا لك وإذا ما سمحت لي سأتحدث في العربية I want to go back to the information mentioned internationally and I depended on my um, feedback uh, on three levels locally, nationally, internationally and I talked about the pandemic and how we turned and how we were able to transform uh, regarding also Gaza. The international uh, commerce forum proved that um, a lot of services will be replaced well EU ones. Let's look at the, both the positive and negative sides. But this development will create 79 million more uh, employment opportunities, which will make us look at the new uh, millions of opportunities. This report talks about the mechanics that make there is a there is an increase that amounts to 33 uh, percent to rebuild the capacities and what amounts to 40 percent to capacity building there is a need an urgent need to capacity build we already have employ employees but that we need to build their capacity, but others with no knowledge at all, which we need to get rid of. So now we're looking at those things. So looking at it from different um, scales. Now the labor market needs different efficiencies like data analysis and the computerization of the market and economic intelligence. The computerization of things and, and getting the internet involved in all of these things. Also, the digital entertainment and 3D printing and alternative uh, energy, many others, all of these things in our world. We have, how do we look at these things? Also, uh, regarding the 5G internet. While we're still talking about 3G in Palestine, but yes, there is a major improvement in this field too. So how do we employ the smart um, technologies in all of our aspects in our lives? Even driving car, but smart. And now we're looking at a different international aspect which is the digital technology that, that transforms the market to create a new employment opportunities. And in Palestine, we have to say, yes, we can, because transforming Palestine will allow to create better employment opportunities in the Palestinian context. For example, the young people in Gaza they make such beautiful success stories in this, uh, in this aspect to break uh, out of their siege in Gaza. And then using the Arab world, uh, logically speaking, for example, the Arab young guy spend six to six and a half hours on their phones. How do we use this revolution in line with the needs of the labor market in Palestine internationally? Talking on the Arab level, yes, there is a lack of the capacities in the side and the economic exchange too. How do we enhance that in brief in brief i can say 
the future of digital uh, economy in Palestine is linked to the government work to provide the infrastructure needed um, to enable that and setting the rules and laws to govern to govern the processes and grow in the investments and the private and public sectors to work together. So utilizing the human resources and young capacities by encouraging them to be innovative and to digitally um, consume and to make easy the interactions online. And recently we've been on a meeting talking about the use of these numbers. What we need to do on the Palestinian level is following national strategies to develop the digital skills, which will enhance the Palestinian position and solve the unemployment problems, not only by creating new job opportunities, but also by um, in, uh, enabling Palestinians to enter international um, markets. So it has to enable the young people to understand the importance of digital digitalization and talking about main causes I will end with. First, we have to not forget the importance of uh, of how involved our technology is with the occupation and how we can enhance it economically. And on the governmental level, we have to provide training centers um, that targets not only the university students, but all those. And this is very important. It's not only to university students, but also to non-university students, to graduates, and those who ended the school years. No, we have to keep a pace with this aspect, and even to schools. And then uh, the ministries shall work on developing the curriculums um, to bridge the gap between the outcomes and, of the schools and the needs of the market. There is a very high level of unemployment in the media sector. So the media sector needs journalists who have uh, digital skills needed. So there is a need to create a revolutionary here. Um, and then keeping a pace with the four, with the 4G and the economy and working with corporates, asking them to teach us because if they do, then they will invest in us and in our capacities, which America and China and many other countries are they want to do. And, uh, <laughs> and we have to provide pro projects or programs to support startups, uh, which uh, the, you know, the government did, the last of which was in the IT sector. Most importantly, we have to create a body for the employees of the digital to unions, to, uh, to labor unions. And I'm ready for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rami. This is a very feedback. We wanted you to talk more about government, but you talked in general, which is amazing. All of these recommendations are very excellent and very needed. We need to, 
you know, this is, um, it's meant for the education employment side. It aims to reduce unemployment um, side. So going to ba back to English. Sorry, I don't have any reply, so I will ask myself the questions to the participants. So uh, we'll start. The first, uh, inter 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 intervenant with Francy, I don't know how to Francy. Say the Dima, Miss Dima. Uh, you spoke uh, to us about the AI, the, the introduction of artificial intelligence in job markets and uh, to know what jobs are out there and so on. So uh, uh, what do you think the, the needed skills are? Saro spoke about some skills uh, for the future, but uh, especially in the digital world, do, would you like to uh, recommend some uh, digital some skills needed for the future world? This is the first question to you. Um, thank you for, uh, for the question. Um, I think there is no specific uh, skill that you would say this is the skill of the future. As uh, my uh, um, uh, colleagues discuss different skills, for example, Sarah talked about uh, using a tablet as a, as a bus driver, or even, you know, for people who work in hotels, housekeeping, you need to know uh, uh, to be able to use uh, technology. Uh, so it's, it's not really a specific skill that we can talk about when it comes to, to working in a digital economy. But I think one excellent point that uh, uh, Rami talked about, which is, you know, taking opportunity of this you know, global revolution or this, let's call it uh, work without borders. Now you can uh, become a programmer, you can become a data engineer, you can become uh, an analyst, uh, you can work in, in, in marketing and, uh, and all sorts of jobs. So there is the, first of all, the basic digital uh, literacy, which is every person who uh, wants to be involved in the job market in the future, there are specific and uh, basic digital skills that they need to learn. And of course, we're talking about uh, inclusion here. So we, we, we shouldn't be leaving anyone behind. And I think uh, uh, Hania also uh, was one of the people who had really uh, an, an opinion about how we are not supposed to leave anyone behind and how we, we need to make sure that this is really inclusive. Uh, so this is this is one one part of the skills that we're talking about. The second one is the specialized and the technical skills, uh, and that is something that we can really uh, uh, easily say that, for example, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, first of all the skills that uh, we need anyways, regardless of what job we 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 have, which is the soft skills, the communication skills, the emotional uh, intelligence, for example, is a very important skill. Uh, but at the same time, we really need to uh, work on the technical skills. If we need, if we want our youth uh, in 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 our uh, uh, cities to be able to compete, for example, with a young Indian or someone who's sitting in a country that. Uh, really is good at technology. If we want them to compete, we need to also make sure that we equip them with the technical skills, again, based on making sure that there is a demand for these jobs. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dima. But uh, maybe there is a confusion about uh, the expression digital literacy and digital skills or technology uh, skills or so on. So I would like to say one sentence about it. 
So digital literacy is the ability to effectively and cre uh, critically navigate, evaluate, and create information using a range of digital technologies. And it has an impact on the user in different uh, kinds of uh, fields. For example, in the creativity, in the collaboration. And we heard Mr. Faris spoke speaking about earlier early about the environment of collaboration that is needed and it is it uh, the digital literacy has one of the impacts of on the co collaboration so we can collaborate together even if we are in different parts of the world there's the critical thinking and evaluation there is the culture and social understanding and that was what uh, suha the, the the lady that uh, msania spoke about that uh, faced a problem because of that. And there is the e-safety, which is very important. And also Hania spoke about surfing in, in the safety, safely in the digital world. So e-safety is very important subject here. There are also practical and functional skills that are needed. And of course, there is a very uh, important impact about professional communicator, which uh, Rami a little bit spoke about in uh, in his uh, how to communicate and how to speak about uh, and how to uh, uh, how to show me all the yeah <laughs> get uh, uh, these all these digital skills and what to do so uh, let's go to the second question to uh, uh, saru so we we heard from uh, dima about uh, the digital skills and so on do you think what do you think about the universities uh, the curriculum in the universities the gaps and what is uh, what do you think as an education for employment institute what do you think or do advise the universities to do for their curriculum or like cooperation with you about this issue please go ahead um sorry did i uh, i am okay we so, hear you I thought I was not uh, unmuted. Okay, so uh, it, it is very critical that the universities and, uh, and what we call university private sector partnerships are created. And these partnerships come uh, together to look at the needs of uh, the employers and to look at what the universities are uh, offering in terms of uh, educational programs. And uh, it, it has been a trend today in the world that a lot of corporations are, uh, uh, in a way, uh, working very closely with the universities to come up with uh, specific programs uh, where you will find that a university is, is, is specifically, for example, coming up with a program uh, for, a, for, for a specific, let's say, IT uh, organization that requires specialized skills. And they say that we will have, for example, 25 students of a classroom will be working within this IT company uh, for a semester and will work and will come and uh, study at the university for a semester. I think Al Quds University is, is, is a pioneer in one of these programs, but other universities have also uh, uh, implemented that. Uh, and so it is very important, for example, I, I would talk about the, the business uh, school uh, in a university where uh, business people should sit in, as, in advisory uh, positions within the business school to discuss future curriculum. And we know that in Palestine, uh, to change curriculum, it takes a lot of time. If we want to introduce new curriculum within uh, a, a university, and especially a new program, it, it will take one to two years until the program is developed and then until it is accredited by the, by the ministry. So this has to be an ongoing process of collaboration between university and private sector to make sure that what the, what the universities are offering is what the private sector wants. Yeah, uh, you want us about two uh, issues that you worked with the universities about the engineering uh, um, for the faculty of engineering and also uh, which, which other uh, the bridging the gap for uh, the nurses also maybe maybe this will uh, come into the university curriculum issue and uh, will advance uh, uh, something that they miss in the university for their graduates what do you think 
Yes, uh, for one or two sentences before we go to Mr. Ferris. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, example that I can give with the university collaboration with the engineering department of uh, universities, where we came up with a program for 120 hours of training for engineering graduates in the management of engineering rather than in, in the technical part of engineering, where we some of the things that we had in this is looking at how to write a proposal, uh, how to do specifications, how to go out into the market and find pricing and so forth, which is something that uh, is not part of the university curriculums. And this was a gap that we found uh, uh, by working with universities. And then we came up with this particular curriculum, 120 hours, with eight different modules that filled this, this part of the uh, uh, specific part of the curriculum that made a engineer when he went out and competed in, in the market specifically. Uh, if I may, another example uh, that we had was very important was creating up a virtual jobs program that we had at EFE. Uh, this was, we came up with the idea when we were doing an assessment to find out employability and the, and the great number of graduates that were coming out. So we said that we will come up with a program that will help the digital capability of graduates so that they will become themselves uh, freelancers. Uh, and this program was, was built by looking at uh, how they can enter the international market uh, for example, part of the program was looking at the global workforce, assessing opportunities in the global market, preparing a digital journal for yourself, uh, personal balance uh, in selecting your skills competencies and showing them to a customer who is looking for those skills, looking at the competition. And this is extremely important because we found out that although we are we have specific talents and we can get in the international market, but we had two problems. Our prices were much higher than the international competitors that are sitting in India and in many other countries, uh, even though we, we are not part of the uh, more, let's say, advanced countries, but still our prices were higher. And secondly, we, we had a problem with the, uh, with the content uh, and uh, so that we started looking at not only getting them into these markets, but also strengthening them in the content of the uh, freelancing that they were doing. Thank you, Saro. Um, Mr. Faris, Saro uh, keeps speaking about job seekers, freelancers, opportunities in the global market. But there is something else called entrepreneurship. Yeah? So we don't want uh, our youth to be always seeking a job. OK, it's good. <laughs> there are people for job uh, seeking jobs or people uh, working for freelancing or they are still jobs not creating jobs for others so what do you think uh, how we could we engage the youth in entrepreneurship more uh, than also only finding job but creating jobs for others please go ahead yeah, thank you so much. And I agree, there's just so much to discuss here with this topic. But entrepreneurship is something that's been missing from many universities and many institutions. But for the last 10 years, I will say, I have seen a rise of what I'm going to call the EIRs. And, and I've, I've been lucky to have had many of these roles through multiple universities, which basically stands for executive or entrepreneur and resident to back up Sarah's point, which is engaging the entrepreneurs of what is needed today in today's marketplace. Now, there's a confusion in the marketplace about entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, most of the times people think of an entrepreneur as the multimillionaire, the multi-billionaire that start businesses. The reality actually is most entrepreneurs have started either you know, a grocery store, a shawarma sandwich stop, right? Or something like that that keeps them going for life or a falafel stand. And a lot of times we bypass them because we think they're irrelevant or they're not as important to the economy. And the reality is they're the most economically impactful players in any community. And the reason I say that because they might employ someone for a day or two or for a show or two that allows someone else to make that little extra cash that's looking for a freelancing job, that's looking for a small side gig. And they provide those kinds of opportunities for the community that most times they don't 
does not exist in a larger corporation. So entrepreneurship, the way you want to do that is by A, exposing it to them. So having an EIR on residents that's walking around. So it's kind of like what people see is what people want to be. And if you don't expose them that there is an entrepreneurship pathway because you're showing them how to be an accountant, how to be a lawyer, how to be whatever the scenario is, unfortunately, then they can't imagine what it could look like for them to start or grow a business or do their own thing. So you have to expose them. The second thing I'm going to say is, you know, I love what uh, Sarah talked about is the short certifications, three, six months or 12 months. I've seen a big rise in it all over the world now with all the different universities doing it. And again, engaging in those kind of uh, shorter term assignments, entrepreneurs or what I'm going to call experts in the field versus an educator, which is nothing wrong with them, actually. They're, they're wonderful and you should also seek them. I'm just saying adding a component to it of having someone in the field. So therefore, they're speaking from the experience that they're having in that industry. And the last thing I'm going to say, two more things I'm going to mention uh, is really number three is ongoing education. This whole concept of uh, four-year degree needs to be shifted a little bit to be more on ongoing education. And so therefore, although yes, you could get your four-year degree or to master's degree or PhD or whatever that is, you could also have an ongoing education for open enrollment and things of that nature. And the last point I'm going to mention is the multidisciplinary, um, you know, multidisciplines act. Unfortunately, many universities still act that, you know, if you want to have a bachelor degree in computer science, you got to finish all these courses and they're all in my engineering school. You are not going to take anything in, you know, education school or entrepreneurship school and things of that nature. So opening it up to having a multidisciplinary or actually forcing it to be a multidisciplinary will rise up the idea of entrepreneurship because now it's the whole mindset is thinking, what else can I be doing with my skills versus what I have to learn to get a job? So I'm going to stop with those four points uh, to, to leave it up to, you know, more discussions. I just want to elaborate on again, rise of uh, residents and entrepreneur in residence, the short term certifications, the ongoing education and the multidisciplinary approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ferris. And I think uh, Hania will uh, uh, speak more about these certificates and the skills needed uh, for the digital world, as we said, uh, through their program uh, for the MIL, the Media uh, Information Literacy. And uh, the question to you, Hania, from the expression that Mr. Ferris said, and it's very difficult to repeat, multidisciplinary. <laughs> so I think your MIL program is also multidisciplinary and needs uh, different skills. So what do you think, how can you promote it in Palestine? And uh, what are the challenges uh, that you can face and also the challenges for the digitization of the economy? So let's hear from you, Hania. And meanwhile, uh, Mr. Rami, please tell us the chat, if you want. Go ahead, Hania. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Safa. Actually, um, really talking about uh, MIL and its connection to digitalization, I think it's very important. And I hope that all those people working uh, to really work on uh, digital, digitalized economy and creating opportunities online. As Mr. Mahda, we mentioned that there are millions of opportunities that can come in the future, certainly on the expense of some uh, traditional jobs, but at least there are opportunities coming. But uh, when we talk about media and information literacy, I think now it's the buzzword uh, worldwide. Uh, it's not really like, uh, it, it enforced itself because it's really like, uh, I think we pronounce it like boy, uh, when, you, when you try to swim and to rescue people in the, in the seas, this is what you use. So MIL is really like the life uh, uh, boy uh, when it comes to digitalization. Now in Palestine, we have been working mainly with UNESCO and the Deutsche Welle Academy, a German institute, because both are really like experts in media and information literacy. And really, we are proud to say that in Palestine, we are one of the leading nations in the Arab world when it comes to media and information literacy. So for us as an organization, and certainly there are other people in Palestine working in the sphere as well. But really, we have uh, succeeded in creating a culture 
of media and information literacy. So now you have, uh, we have really reached out to more than 5,000 young people, whether at the school or university level, with this, um, with this uh, life skills uh, uh, set. We also like have worked with lots of um, teachers, with government officials, especially from the public relations uh, um, departments and different Palestinian ministries, uh, different CBOs, NGOs. In addition to that, we have been working hardly on the policy level. I think if you uh, read lots of um, uh, uh, um, reviews related to digitalization and MIL, you will see that it's very important to institutionalize it in the educational system, whether we are talking on the school level or on the university level. And luckily, we had some open-minded uh, ministers in Palestine, uh, but still they need more, more pushing. But we succeeded actually to, um, to work with them on incorporating 19 uh, articles related to MIL into the Palestinian curriculum. The challenge now is how to integrate it fully into the Palestinian uh, curriculum. And also, um, we had a conference actually two, uh, two years ago, and a major recommendation that came out of it is how to create a, a, a curriculum at the university level. And just last month, five universities combine, combined forces, and they, with the help of UNESCO, they are going to actually develop a unified curriculum on MIL, which will be taught in the five universities together. So always we say we attribute things to Pialara because we were the initiators of the ideas. And something very important, I think, has to do with the fact that we are also working on the regional level when it comes to MIL. So we did uh, extensive research in seven Arab countries on the situation of MIL uh, in those different countries. Um, we also like had a conference just uh, two weeks ago in Palestine, four, uh, five Arab countries on media and information literacy with the help of Deutsche Welle. And part of this was the creation of a regional network for MIL in the Arab world. And of course, I mean, we, we announced it and now we are working on uh, how to really make it operational and very uh, beneficial. Now, you know, I think really, there is no escape from digitalization, for, from linking uh, different aspects of our life with the, uh, these new developments. We are not talking only about economy, it's about tourism, education, health, on different levels. But when, when specifically we are talking about economy and job opportunities, my biggest fear is that, unfortunately, what I foresee is that the digital uh, economy will become a replica of the, the real economy on the ground. I, we have been witnessing how on real ground there, were, there are always those who succeed and who become entrepreneurs and who make it. But uh, at the same time, we have been, uh, many people have lived as cheap labor, not just in Palestine, in different parts of the world. Uh, people with, uh, you know, we have the white color and blue color and I don't know what. And I see that this is actually uh, bringing the same scenario into the digital world. For me, I don't really believe that this issue, we, everybody is talking about inclusiveness, inclusion versus exclusion. And we see that many policies by the EU and other governments, you know, have, have uh, you know, been initiated in order to limit exclusion and work for inclusivity. Even actually the United, the, the EU started looking into um, what kind of languages should also be incorporated into digitalization. So now in the Arab world, actually, our, our challenge is, is much bigger because actually the content in Arabic is very limited uh, online. Um, and unfortunately we don't have educational system that support uh, the, the transformation and the transition and the language. So, uh, so again, we see my, my real fear, and I hope my colleagues can address it, is that we will continue to see those who succeed and become famous and rich and has everything on, on, uh, on, on the expense of those who don't have the language skills, because you don't, if you don't have language and if you don't have the computer skills, digitalization skills, 
you will be left out or will be used as cheap labor online. You know, you know how this will be created. And uh, so either we try to revol rev revol to help me, revolution, <laughs> how to make a revolution in the digital world in terms of the language, or to make it revolutionize. Thank you. This one. So everyone, every time I want to say it, I do that and you do it. So how how uh, how to really make a revolution on the uh, digital uh, uh, the systems in order to include the languages that make it makes it more accessible to people, or to do a revolution on our educational systems. Because if we continue to go in the same direction, the scenarios will be the same in the future. So, uh, so this is what actually uh, I hope could be addressed. In addition, actually, to a quotation that I want to, to use by uh, Mr. Nader Kabani, maybe some of you uh, know him, he's a senior fellow at Brookings uh, Doha Center, who says that digitalization can enhance opportunities, but exasperate inequalities. And I think also lots of studies have been done about inequalities when it comes to the digital economy. So, uh, so there are, those are some of the challenges at, at, and fears that I would like to, to, see, to see if somebody can address. Thank exactly, you. I wanted to, I, I wrote the sentence before just you to say it, that digital transformation will reduce jobs. And that was a debate uh, last uh, night when we had a workshop about the digital inclusion and uh, uh, digital literacy and higher education. So would uh, a digital transformation reduce jobs? Because many people will find out themselves out of jobs because of uh, the digital divide and because of the exclusion that you spoke about. So let's ask Mr. Rami uh, his opinion about uh, the digital uh, transformation and redu uh, reducing jobs and as well as what they did as a ministry uh, together with the um, uh, civil society organizations uh, for uh, lessening the exclusion or doing the inclusion. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Really, we have a good relation with the civil society. In the last two years, exactly when we facing the intervention of Corona, by the way, this is a most important thing that how we did with a lot of projects. I can uh, mention, for example, Educated through their platform, how we are target a lot of uh, employers and students with the different cities inside Palestine and outside. So we have a good relation uh, with the different uh, topics. For example, about the e-learning, it is an important with our students in the VTC, in the training centers, how we use their platform to, uh, uh, to give them their skills. We have also with uh, another uh, uh, civil society, they have, uh, for example, to give and teach the skills of e-learning this is an important for e-learning. This is what we find it as a weaknesses of the cooperatives that we have with a lot of women, with the youth, how we, they should use the uh, e-learning, the e-market uh, uh, with that, with the e-advertising, with a lot of uh, uh, data that they have. By the way, I, I believe that we should uh, cooperate as a government and as a civil society and the private sector with, uh, with this uh, dilemma regarding the uh, corona, because corona gave us a lot of lessons, one of it, how to use the technology. And really, one of the experience, I should uh, mention it with the international organization, GIZ. GIZ through the GIZ that they have something called home-based business. And through the home-based business, we success to, to target in the pilot project with a 30 project, most of them by technology. They use the technology. And the, the others of them with exactly with the woman, and here I want to put a recommendation for the civil society, they should also target the, uh, the cooperatives that they lead by women, unfortunately, they didn't use how to know the uh, e-market, for example, with their products. So some, something like that we face it through the uh, corona pandemic. A lot of intervention that we do it with international organization, we face that the technology is far away from the SMEs. 
and here is my recommendation also for the SMEs, how we should give them, empowering them, enable them to use that with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, how can I say, friendly user. This is the word, friendly user with the technology through uh, the e market. The, the other thing is what we, about the cooperation with the civil society, I should mention about the labor uh, sector strategy and the employment strategy that we launching last uh, four months by uh, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Ishtaya, the Prime Minister, and with the Arab League and with the ILO, that one of the topic, it is how we should use the uh, technology through and support the uh, SMEs. And the government alone, to be honest, we cannot alone that we we need the help from the civil society with international also society that they should give us like uh, empowering. What I mean by empowering, it's not just to teach or give them a training, but also about the infrastructure. I don't know, maybe Saro, he said, talk about the uh, the iPad or the, uh, the tools. So the tools here even for the people with vulnerable groups, they are needed. Last week, and here I will uh, stop about uh, vulnerable, I wanna talk, mention about the uh, disabled people, how we should use the technology to support the disabled people through their SMEs. And here we will give a, a paper uh, and we will uh, share it maybe next week, how we should use the technology to support vulnerable women, uh, home, uh, the people uh, far away from the village, for example, from the area C, for example, if they are have this credibility. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rami. And I encourage you to contact EFE and Pialara uh, because they both have many programs for the disabled, for the for women and for the rural areas, especially rural areas because both institutions here concentrate on these target groups that we, other peoples do not concentrate on. So I encourage you to contact them. And uh, as we spoke about EFE, we spoke about Al-Quds University, Saro mentioned that, and uh, these are my, some of my hats. I would like to speak about the other hat that I didn't speak about, which is the Higher Council for Innovation and Excellence. Mm -hmm. So any support for SMEs needed we at the Higher Council, Higher Council for Innovation and Excellence are ready to support infrastructure, seed money, training, business uh, plans, whatever needed for SMEs. We even worked with the Ministry of National Economy to uh, write the new law that was uh, accredited by His Excellency, uh, um, our president, Mahmoud Abbas, lately last week, and it's uh, still not published in the newspaper, the official newspaper, but uh, they, there are many things to support SMEs in the, with the new law. And uh, as I said, uh, there are lots of initiatives, uh, unfortunately, in Palestine, within the government, within the different ministries, that are not well known to you as Ministry of Labor, maybe, or to you as Rami, I don't know. But there are lots of uh, strategies for, if there is a digital transformation strategy at the Ministry of uh, uh, ICT, a Ministry of Telecom Information Technology. There is a digital uh, transformation strategy at the Ministry of Higher Education also. Uh, I know that because yesterday, as I told you, we had a, uh, session about uh, these strategies and what they are doing in that. Uh, so uh, the Ministry of uh, Education, not higher education, also has a strategy and they are teaching uh, IT skills, they are teaching I, uh, um, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, with together with the uh, civil society organizations like in NISAC and others uh, to uh, students at schools. So uh, we have really lots of uh, things going on in Palestine, and I'm really proud of the initiatives that are uh, going on. So now we have only five minutes, and you are five. So one minute for each as a last recommendation, last sentence, please, quickly. Dima, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, 
uh, for, for this conversation. I just want to go back to one point, and this is going to be my closing statement. Uh, we're not losing these jobs. We're transitioning from jobs to jobs. And now uh, the one thing that we need to do is to make sure that uh, we transition uh, correctly. We equip people, skill them, reskill them, upskill them. We do whatever we need to make sure that we transition easily. Jobs will be lost because of automation, because of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, but new jobs will replace these jobs. Exactly. And uh, uh, what we need to do yes. is to make sure that we're ready for that. Very good, very good closing sentence. Thank you, Dima. Mr. Saro, your closing sentence. Uh, unmute yourself. I hear you from the other room, but not uh, from me. <laughs> All right. Um... I say that employers expect candidates for a position to have at least basic IT skills. And if graduates do not get them at the university, they should go out there and get them themselves because they have to have those skills when they go out into the, into the market. Secondly, students before graduation, I am always advocating for this, that they go third year, fourth year, start working somewhere. They do internships, they do any kind of job so that they get out there and, and get some kind of experience. They do some kind of networking and then they will find out that there are certain skills that they need. And one of them is going to be the digital skill because even if you are a waiter today, you have this iPad again in your hand and you are <laughs> taking your uh, orders. You know, uh, <laughs> orders. And if you don't know how to use it, you cannot even be a waiter. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Saru. Mr. Ferris, your closing session. Uh, sentence. My, oh, yeah, well, there's a lot to say, but I'll say one sentence. Entrepreneurship is a clear, solid pathway for many people and should be explored. And small and medium enterprise, of course, is another way to support this new generation of talent individuals in the digital life's world. I'm going to also just throw one more thing since we have Rami here, as well as you, uh, Safa. It could be an opportunity for government to create hackathons to solve some of these problems. And one of the things I've worked with in, in actually in a different country called Belarus, I'm a hackathon to solve you know, government problems. I will mention one thing that I feel Palestine could lead the world for, which is creating a Palestinian currency that's digital. It could really empower the people and that you could use it to leverage ways to make things happen. Of course, it's easy for me to say uh, sitting here in my home in Michigan, but I'm just saying that as a statement that could be maybe explored. Yeah, well, uh, the first thing, uh, with the f not the first, one of the first uh, tasks, uh, Doc Muhammad, uh, Doc, um, Dr. His, His Excellency, Dr. Muhammad Shtaye, when he uh, became the prime minister, he said, we will create our digital Palestinian currency. So I hope they will, uh, we will see that in the near future because it is really possible. Thank you for this advice. And regarding the hackathons, I myself participated as a jury member and as an organizer for at least four hackathons in Palestine. We are at the Higher Council of Innovation and Excellence have uh, in November a hackathon re regarding fintech. So we would like you to have a speech there or address the participants if it's possible with your timing. So Hania, closing ses uh, sentence. <laughs> Session. Okay. I will do my you closing. need a complete session, I know. <laughs> no, no, not really. Actually, maybe many people listening to all this, they feel, oh my God, you know, I myself, I don't like all this digitalization. I'm a romantic, traditional person who loves to live in the, uh, how things were used to happen in the past. You know, I want to go to see my doctor, to take my education uh, online, to travel, to do business the traditional way. But unfortunately, the world is going in a different direction. There is no escape from what we have been discussing today. And if we don't wake up and smell the coffee, you know, already we are behind as uh, Arab nations uh, and as Palestine. So really, it's like, uh, I think we are fortunate to have such minds, such in, intelligent and talented people who know where the world is heading, who know where Israel is heading. Actually, just uh, during Corona, the Israeli government was discussing abolishing all schools, just leaving a few schools in certain uh, neighborhoods for common issues. 
but that all the educational system should be online. So we as Palestinians, we really have to really like uh, uh, follow concrete and very great steps in order not to be left behind. It's enough to be plagued by occupation. So at least we have to really liberate our minds in order to uh, live in a uh, in a better future uh, for us and for our children. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Hania. Thank you. Very very good closing from your side. And now we have we have don't have one minute, but we will give you one minute, Rami to have the last closing session. And before that, I thank you all for your participation and would like to keep the contact for further projects in Palestine and cooperation. Go ahead, Dramit, Faddan. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you all. Uh, my, our hand is open uh, from uh, Labor Ministry, our VTC, for any uh, pilot project regarding the uh, technology, it's open. Anyone he can, uh, let's build the bridge. And thanks for the invitation, Doctor. We will meet Saro and my uh, friend Hania soon, uh, maybe we can find something and uh, create something output from this uh, gathering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rami. And uh, the last big thanks uh, goes to ACTED, uh, first of all, which is a French nonprofit uh, international organization who is organizing this uh, project together with Convergence, which is also a platform for reflection, advocacy, and mobilization, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, convergence, uh, uh, private, public, and associate sectors to promote the sustainable development goals. So thank you, everyone here, and thank you for the people behind the scene who made it possible for us to meet and discuss this very important issue. Thank you all, and have a very good continuation of the day today and a good future for the coming days. Thank you very much and goodbye.